Turn your Bibles, please, to Mark's Gospel as we come back to our study of this material. We took a couple of week diversion to examine a portion of 2 Kings and ask the question of one another, do, what do you see? Because the disciples in Mark chapter 9 had seen something very amazing. We call the episode the Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And we looked at that a few weeks ago. And I want us to turn our thoughts today to Mark chapter 9, verses 9 to 13, as we we think about the cost of sharing the gospel. You may have noticed if you read through Mark that Jesus has begun revealing himself and he's begun telling them it's going to be difficult. It's going to be rough. It's going to be deadly to identify with me. It has been as people in the past have identified with God, it's going to get increasingly so, identifying with Jesus as the Son of God. Mark chapter 9, verses 9 to 13, I hope you found that in your Bible. If you don't have your Bible, we have the text on the screen, but we really want to give you a Bible. And so if you would see us after the service, we'll make arrangements for that. If you'd stand with me and follow along as I read this passage, Mark 9, verses 9 to 13, reading from the English Standard Version. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the grave, from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come. And they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. This is what? It is the apparent, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. Let's tie some things together. They saw Elijah with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. I asked you the last couple of weeks, what do you see? Then today, let's think about not only the cost of discipleship that Jesus has already laid out, but the cost of sharing the gospel. Thank you. Be seated. Well, you may recall, it's been a few weeks now, but he took Peter, James, and John up onto this mountain. We call it the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, the, one of the significant things about it, where it is located, it's located on the other side of Jordan. And there, Moses and Elijah show up. And it's, it's interesting to me, I think it bears observing that Moses had been prohibited from going across into the land beyond the Jordan. And yet, coming back, he is there in that very land on a mountain with Jesus, he and Elijah, fellowshipping with Jesus. And and they talked, remember, about, I told you that time, there's a Greek word that's used in in Mark. They spoke of his echodus, his his exodus. Just as Moses had been involved in an exodus, Jesus was going to be involved in an exodus. He was going to lead captivity captive. He was going to bring many sons to glory through his suffering and death and burial and resurrection and ascension. Well, after that experience there, Peter said, this this is wonderful. (laughs) This is what life ought to be like. Let's just stay here. Now, it's commendable that he was so captivated by what he saw but it was pretty selfish because there's a whole lot of people not on the mountain that he should have been concerned about as well. And, and so that's when God breaks in, remember, and he says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. The implication being, you don't need to make things up, Peter. We don't, we don't need your ideas. We really had this already figured out. Just listen to him and follow him. Hear his voice. Do what he says. And so they're coming off the mountain now. And you see this. Interesting exchange. I I want to unpack it for you just quickly today under four headings. First, Jesus' unusual request. Second, the disciples' confusion concerning the resurrection. Third, the disciples' unusual question concerning Elijah. And fourth, Jesus' response. It's It's a warning concerning coming suffering. It's good for us to hear this today, I think. Let's look first of all at this unusual request. They're coming off the mountain. They've just seen the most amazing thing they've ever seen. In fact, we believe Jesus shows this to them so that they will be convinced he is the Christ. He is the winner, 
No matter what happens in the future, he rules and overrules. He is greater than anything they've ever contemplated. He is greater than all the prophets. He is greater than the law. He is greater than the covenants. He is greater than the promises because he is the fulfillment of all of these. He will be greater than Caesar. He'll be greater than Herod. He'll be greater than Pontius Pilate. He is the greatest of all. And they're coming off this mountain. And you'd want to share that. And Jesus makes this request. He charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. He gave them a peek into future glory, a little glimpse of heaven, if you please. And yet this was not a message that they were to share until after, it tells them, until after I've risen from the dead. Now, he's, he's referenced his death at the hands of, of the cruel men at the hands of the religious elite. He's referenced that already, that he will die. He'll suffer and die and rise again. But this time, coming off the mountain, when he says, until I've risen from the dead, that catches them. So the second thing you see here is that this confusion they have, verse 10, so they kept the matter to themselves. In other words, they, they did as they were told, kept the matter themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. What is, what's, it, what's entailed in that? What, what, would bring it to, what would bring to pass the necessity for him to rise from the dead? There was a Jewish teaching that in the, in the last day, there would be this sort of general uh, resurrection to face a judgment. And the Jews understood that what would happen is that they as Jews would be vindicated by Jehovah, the judge, and that all the enemies of the Jews would be eradicated. No doubt that's running around in their minds. What is, what is the meaning of this rising from the dead? So they still don't get it. But I'll re remind you that when you read through the Gospels and you get to the crucifixion and you get to the resurrection and you're heading to the book of Acts, you'll, you'll read sometimes that these, then they remembered. Then they remembered when he said that there's some things that, that the Holy Spirit then takes and clarifies and applies and opens up and, and makes sense of it. But this didn't make sense to them. He's standing before them right now. They know that he has made the religious people angry. They know that. They're, they're sensing the intensifying of that, uh, of that antagonism. And he's told them before that he will, he will suffer at the hands of the pre priests and the scribes. But they cannot wrap their minds around him rising from the dead. Because they still can't conceive that if he is who he says he is and they, they believe in some level that he is, they cannot believe that he would be killed. And they cannot believe that the, that the very people, the scribes, the priests, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the, the religious bodies of the day who, who spent their time teaching the Jewish people not to give up because one was coming who would deliver them, they found it hard to believe that if he was indeed the deliverer, how could it be that the religious people would kill him? And so they're confused about this, and we don't need to begrudge that. We would have been too, particularly in light of what they just saw. They saw him fellowshipping with Moses and Elijah for crying out loud. What, what in the world could overcome him? If he communes with the departed men of God. The third thing, though, we're getting into the, the meat of the passage here. They, they ask this unusual question concerning Elijah. I say unusual because you get the sense that they're on the wrong track here. And then Jesus is going to... I think point that out here in his response. They've just seen Moses and Elijah. They've just seen, heard Jesus say something about that they need to be quiet about the event, the episode, until he rises from the grave. And I, I'm just going to con conjecture that having seen Elijah, Having heard Jesus speak of something that sounds very apocalyptic, it, it, has, it has real overtones to it to end times. That in their confusion about the resurrection, they ask 
what to them might be a clarifying issue. What, what do the scribes say? Why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? Why? Why is that a, an indicator that first Elijah must come? This, if they're thinking of end times, and I think they are, what's the significance of Elijah coming first? And, and how are we to understand what we just saw with Elijah being there? But which, which, of course, meant that he had lived previously and then, remember, he, he did not suffer death as we understand it. He was taken up in a chariot of fire. We, we could speak, you know, you can't speak legitimately of the assumption of Mary, but you can speak legitimately of the assumption of Elijah, all right? He was taken up into heaven. They're referencing or at least have in their minds, I think, Malachi 4, 5, and 6, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Now, that, that's, that's a whole other message in itself, but I simply would observe that when you see a land where fathers' hearts are turned against their children and children's hearts are turned against their father, that, that there, is, there is judgment in such a land. There's judgment in such a land. Malachi the prophet, the, the last voice of God who would be silent for 400 years following this, until John the Baptist breaks on the scene calling for repentance because the kingdom of God is at hand. The last voice through the prophet Malachi says, I will send you Elijah the prophet. He had already come and been assumed into heaven. What is this talking about? And of course, there's a couple of different perspectives on this. John the Baptist was described in the early passages of the New Testament, Luke 1, 17 being an example, he will go before him, that is he'll go before Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And so you, you see, you begin to see that there is this connection between Elijah the prophet and John the Baptist. I want you to stay with me here a minute. There is, there is about prophecy, the term is proleptic is the, is the language used. There is an immediate fulfillment, there is a foreshadowing of future fulfillment, and there's final fulfillment. This happens sometimes in the, in the prophetic voice and vision. And I think that's what you're seeing here. Jesus says in, uh, earlier in, I think in Matthew 11, verse 4, I don't have it on the slides for you, but he says, if you can handle it, <laughs> John the Baptist is Elijah the prophet. Now, John the Baptist was asked this question directly, are you Elijah? He says, no, I'm not. So what's going on here? I think, the way you've got to see this, Elijah came. He ascended in the chariot of fire, which, which in the mind of a Jew meant he could, he could come back. They would think that more of him than they could of Moses. Even though Moses died, we know he died, and, and, and the Lord took care of his burial. They, they could see Elijah coming back. So there was this, when they, when they understood the prophecy of Malachi, they looked for Elijah to come back. And the one who comes is John the Baptist. He comes in the spirit and power of Elijah. He comes 
saying, I'm not Elijah, but Jesus says, I'll tell you, Elijah, if, if you can handle it, John the Baptist is Elijah. So hold on to that a minute now. Look at number four here. Jesus' response to their question, a warning concerning coming suffering. He said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. All right, hold, let's just jump down to, the, to verse 13. But I tell you that Elijah has come. And they did to him whatever they pleased as it is written of him. Okay. Biblical background here. Second Kings chapter, uh, First Kings chapter 18 and 19. You need to read that sometime. Uh, it's, it's the fascinating story of Elijah's encounter uh, with, uh, with Ahab and, and Jezebel. Jezebel has the prophets of God slaughtered. Uh, you, if you know that relationship at all, Jezebel and Ahab. Ahab was, was a wimp of incredible proportions. He is, he is the picture uh, example of what Robert Lewis refers to in men's fraternity as the soft male. He, Jezebel runs over him. He's a, he's a puppet king as far as that goes. And she had the prophets of God slaughtered because they didn't, she didn't like the message they were giving about, about their relationship, hers and Ahab's relationship. And there's this encounters with, with Elijah and Ahab. And it's, in some areas, Ahab is, is scared to death. And then in other things, Elijah is scared to death. He's, he's, he's terrified of Jezebel. You'll remember the encounter up on, the, up on Mount Carmel with the, with the prophets of Baal. There's, we're told there's like 400 prophets of Baal and I think 450 prophets of Asherah. And they, they gather and Elijah says, let's find out whose God is the real God here. And so they build an altar. And they place a bull on it. And basically the, the contest is whoever can call down his God first to consume the sacrifice, it'll be proven that this is the true and living God and that your, your gods, Baal, the Baals, are false gods. And so it's set up. You remember the story, no doubt. Everything's set and Elijah says, no, this, this, really is, not, this is not ready yet. So they dig a trench around the altar. And they begin to pour water. They soak the sacrifice in water. I would submit to you that they did not have an instrument to set that sacrifice on fire. By the time it got through, the water filled up the trench. And if you remember the story, Elijah basically says, you go first. And they begin to call upon the Baals to come and consume the sacrifice to prove how great Baal is. And then Elijah starts mocking them. Well, get a little louder. Maybe your God's asleep. Maybe that's, you just caught him at nap time. Mocking them. And you remember they began to cut themselves. The, the, the whole idea of self-flagellation uh, was, was a part of their way of, of demonstrating their sincerity to their God. Nothing happens. And finally Elijah says, step back. And he asked the Lord to show himself to be God. And he consumes this soaked sacrifice. And he has the prophets of Baal rounded up and he has them executed. And then Jezebel sends out the message that just as we did to the prophets of the Lord and just as you've done to the prophets of Baal, may it be done to me if I don't have your head soon. And Elijah runs and hides, remember? The angel of the Lord shows up. What are you doing here, Elijah? He says, well, I'm the only one left. And he says, no, there's a great multitude preserved. And so that's the background to Elijah. He was indeed persecuted. When, when Jesus said, verse 13, I tell you, Elijah has come and they did to him whatever they pleased as it is written of him. He was hunted. And he would have been executed had the Lord not protected him and then finally taken him to heaven in a chariot. John the Baptist, move forward. He's preaching. He's, he fears no man. He looks at the religious leaders when they come down by the riverside. Who, who told you to flee the wrath to come, you vipers? He angers the religious leadership. He angers Herod. 
stands outside the palace accusing him of adultery, having his brother's wife. He's thrown in prison, but everybody who's around him is, is terrified of him. And we've already read the narrative where the young lady danced a provocative dance and Herod was we probably intoxicated and caught up with her and I'll give you anything you want up to a certain portion of my kingdom. And she said, I want the head of John the Baptist. And, and it, it terrified Herod. And at one point when Jesus is making himself known, Herod is terrified that John the Baptist has come back to life just as he feared. So you have this experience that Elijah has where he is, he is persecuted and hunted. You have this experience that John the Baptist had where he is, he is thrown in jail and executed. But the disciples have missed the point. Look at verse 12. He said to them, Elijah does come, first to restore all things. In verse, verse 13, I tell you, Elijah has come. But look at the rest of this in verse 12. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? You see, basically what he's saying there is you need to be more concerned about how I am treated than you do about the timing of Elijah's coming. Because how he is treated is a foretaste of how anyone who identifies with him will be treated. He's already taught them the cost of following him. If anyone will come after me, he says earlier, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. But that's the cost the person personally is willing to endure. I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to submit to hardships. What he's talking about here is the external pressure. He will tell them in another place if they treat the master of the house this way. How do you think they'll treat his servants? And it's a call to his disciples to get their heads in the game, focused on the right thing. That when he says to them, do not tell anybody what you've just seen with me and Moses and Elijah fellowshipping, discussing my coming, Exodus. Don't tell anybody that until I have risen from the dead. That what they should be thinking about, and they started discussing it, but they went off on a tangent, is how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? It should take them back to think about what's promised of Elijah. It should take them to recognize that in some form or fashion, John the Baptist is a representation, a modern day representation of Elijah. And for us to fill in the blanks that there's a day coming when the two prophets will come as a witness of judgment upon the generation that is, will be the last generation before Jesus returns. I don't know when that is, folks, but I'll tell you right now, we are a candidate for that. We're a candidate for that. Our focus should be if, if it's foretold of the Son of Man, and not only that, but that we stand 2,000 years on the other side of the cross, and we look back and we know how he was treated. We know how he was despised and rejected of men. That's not prophetic for us. That's reflective. A man of sorrows, knowing much grief, that if they would do that, to the darling Son of God who identified himself as the Son of Man, what do you think they will do to those who insist that he is the only way? 
We've just endured an, an interesting week. If it's possible to experience informational overload concerning the papacy, then we're almost there. And to watch glowing expression after glowing expression, do you realize that the only thing in recent memory that has brought liberals and so-called conservatives together is their adoring praise of Jorge Brugliosa. And what do you think would be thought of the person who would suggest that he's a false prophet? Why? You would be excoriated in the press. You would be the ultimate bigot. But do you realize if you've read our confession, the 1689 London Baptist Confession that we've adopted as our own here, that one of the chapters addresses the papacy and speaks of the one who stands as the Pope, as Antichrist, Folks, you announced that message today, and I promise you, you and I would be called antichrist. You and I would be called blasphemers. You and I would be the bigots. We would be the modern day atheists in this cultural religion. And I'm not here to bash anybody today, but I just think it's a, it needs to be, there needs to be a level of discernment for crying out loud. The person who assumes the title of Pope in the Roman Catholic Church, which boasts 1.1 billion adherents around the world and says that you and I are lapsed Catholics, that's what we are, Lapsed Catholics. Well, I've never been a Catholic. You're a lapsed Catholic. When he takes that position, he takes upon himself the title, the Vicar of Christ. When you unpack what that means, it means that he is the human representation of Jesus Christ on the earth. He is the shepherd who stands as the great shepherd. And why do I tell you that today? Because there is religious pluralism abounding in the land. And it has room for everything except the person who will say that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. Out of the mouth of the Pope at the prayer gathering in New York City, he said he wanted to pray for all of his brothers and sisters in Islam, in the light of the destruction that befell more than 700 when they trampled one another to death in Mecca this past week. I pray for Muslims. I pray for the adherents of Islam. But I do not pray for them because they are my brothers and sisters. I pray for them because they need my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They wanted to chat about the sequence of the coming of Elijah. Jesus said, how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? It's his message to them that if you share this message, Jesus is the Son of God and Son of Man. He is the only Savior of sinners. And no one can have access to God, whatever you call Him. No one can have access to God except through Jesus Christ by repenting of sin and trusting in Him. 
And that message today I submit to you in this pluralistic religious culture is hate speech. <laughs> the message of the love of God shown to sinners in sending his darling son to live the perfect life, keeping the whole law, coming in the fullness of time to die in the place of sinners, rising from the grave, ascending on high, praying even now for his own, and coming again one day, that message is considered a bigoted message. It is already against the law in some European countries to preach that message. And if the experience of Kim Davis in Kentucky tells us anything, it tells us that religious, pluralistic America has no room for a message that is exclusive. And yet our Savior said, I am the way, the truth, the life. So how should we live in times like these? I'll tell you what we need to do. We need to love sinners as sinners. We need to be not, not bashful. We need to be unashamed to share the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Because let me tell you the good news. I'm reading two books right now. One's entitled Dreams and Visions. One's entitled Killing Christians. Written by the same fellow about a movement that is taking place in Europe and the Middle East where Muslims are coming to faith in Jesus Christ at record numbers. Islam has failed them. Islam has turned on them. They're empty. They're hopeless. And in, and in ways that are amazing to me, I, can't, I won't go into today, but they are having encounters with Jesus and are seeking out the people who follow Jesus to say, tell me what this means. One of the great perpetrators who has taken glee and delight in killing children as he serves ISIS has fled for his life, seeking refuge, being shared the gospel of Jesus Christ because he discovered that his life was offensive to Jesus. There's a great movement going on, folks. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. It's going to get darker here. It's okay. We have a God who's always been with us and has promised he'll be with us to the end. Take the good news of Jesus Christ. You may not see the person immediately respond. What, what we're hearing from overseas is that multitudes, a lot of the refugees who are flooding into Europe are leaving Islam and encountering the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. If we can look beyond our present circumstances and see the bigger picture, what we see is something more glorious than Jesus and Moses and Elijah standing on the mountaintop transfigured. We see the resurrected, reigning, ruling, soon returning Jesus Christ, calling men and women from every tribe and nation and tongue to himself. That's purpose to be a part of that. To be disciples who go with the glorious good news to make disciple makers and see what God will do, how he will bless your life and bless us as a fellowship. Let's pray together.